How about that orange crown warbler? Hi, Matt. No, nope. is there one there? <laughs> <laughs> one more sighting that people should be aware of. Um, downtown Beverly, the church um, of uh, St. Mary by the Sea Church, the great big brick church. There is, has been a peregrine living there for the winter. No way. I saw it for the first time, people told me about it and I saw it for the first time yesterday. Wow, that's right across from Atomic Cafe. I think I know what it I'm is. doing tomorrow morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so just look up, maybe you'll get lucky. Thank you. Anybody else seen any good birds out there? I saw the orange crown war warbler at uh, Gloucester. I saw a uh, an indigo bunting in um, Nahant uh, at the thicket. I got photographs, uh, otherwise no one would have believed me. Um, wow. I saw a yellow uh, breasted chat in the hot thicket. Um, thick billed moor myrrh at uh, uh, Gloucester, the I mean, uh, state pier, state fish pier. Um, and that one was really uh, close to the pier. Uh, um, I haven't seen the golden eagle yet though, but. Uh, Oh, a black-bellied plover was in Salem last month uh, down at Collins Cove. That was kind of neat. Didn't wow. expect to see that there. Uh, anyways. Good stuff, Shiloh. Uh, nice yeah, work. Any other sightings? I have a question. OK. Did we lose a lot of birds during the blizzard? Uh, it seems that we, the traffic at our bird feeders is down substantially from last week. Hmm. They came to our house because we've had an increase since then in um, common species anyway, juncos and nuthatches and hmm. a few goldfinches. I guess you got to check your neighbor's feeders. Maybe they're putting out better food. <laughs> I've heard that Costco bird seed is, you know, <laughs> top notch. I've heard great horned owls in front of our house. Uh, it's a pair, so it's pretty exciting. Uh, South Hamilton uh, on Essex Street. And I've heard screech owls. We have owls in the area, which is kind of exciting. So are they like duetting where you get that kind of deeper and then that? Yeah, that's so cool. It's so fun. Yeah, so I think the short answer to the question is, is that feathers are marvelous insulation. So northern species are well equipped to deal with the cold as long as they can find food. There are might be a few southern visitors like Carolina wrens that struggle with a, a blizzard. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jim. Good stuff, everybody. So hopefully everybody gets out tomorrow. Shiloh, maybe I'll join you in that golden eagle hunt. We'll see. Well, I'm, I'm looking. I will be looking. I <laughs> Great. Think, Hope to see you there. <laughs> I, I will. In, uh, I have a, an owl box up, and there's an eastern uh, screech owl in it. Uh, and if anyone wants to see it, you can come by anytime. The, the, uh, around dusk, it always pops his head out and then sort of just hangs out. And I never even uh, notice when he flies away. But uh, He's been there about a month now, so nice you're, you're welcome. If, if you haven't seen one yet this year and you need it on your list or whatever, it's uh, viewable right from the street. You don't even have to go into the yard. You can see them. Very generous, Shia. Thank you. Well, I think that was great, but we need to move on. And I'd like to hear from Don about her book of the month tonight. Don Paul. <laughs> Everybody, tonight I have the book that you'll need if you're heading down to the beach or maybe even just lounging by the pool till later on today. This is called Florida's Fabulous Water Birds. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was just a fantasy. Actually, for what I have for you tonight is a guide to nature in winter. And this is a book, as it turns out, when I was doing my research, I'm holding a collector's item. Um, I could sell this for a great deal of money, but I'm not going to. So if you have this, don't hang on to it because it's a wonderful book. Um, this originally came out in 1976. 
I think it was in print till about 1979 um, by Donald Stokes. You probably know him from the Stokes Nature Guides with his wife Lillian. Um, and this sort of takes you through snow, trees, insects, plants, tracks. Uh, it's also uh, good for birding. It has a lot in it about nest, birds that you're likely to see around in winter. Um, and it makes it uh, clear that this is really the time to be looking for nests. It's really easy to see them in winter. What I love about this book is that it has just some, it's hard to tell on a, a camera, but these beautiful line drawings uh, throughout the book. And I think that's partly what's made it such a, uh, such a hit. So um, Donald Stokes, A Guide to Nature in Winter, so we can get out there and enjoy the winter uh, and wear your micro spikes. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And thank you for the uh, safety moment. Much appreciated. So without further ado, Janie will introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, Janie Winchell is the ECLC Program Director and the Director of the Art and Nature Center of the Peabody Essex Museum. Janie. Hey there, everyone. Greetings. And um, I don't know about you, but I'm hearing freezing rain outside. So we're not done with this quite yet. Um, and before I introduce tonight's presentation, just a reminder to check that you're muted. Uh, so we don't have interruptions during the presentation. I am Janie Winchell, the Sarah Fraser Robbins Director of the Dottie Brown Art and Nature Center for PAM. And, uh, and also, um, as Constance mentioned, my role for ECOC. So these are co-hosted and co-developed events. And tonight I'm really delighted to be um, offering uh, through ECOC and PAM this, this program focusing on designing cities with birds in mind. Um, Tim Beatley is the Teresa Hines Professor of Sustainable Communities in the School of Architecture at the University of Virginia, where he has taught for the past three decades. His primary teaching and research interests are in environmental planning and policy with a special emphasis on coastal and natural hazards planning, environmental values and ethics, and biodiversity conservation. His writings have focused on creative strategies cities can use to reduce their ecological footprints and become more livable and equitable places in the process. He is the author or co-author of more than 15 books that explore these issues, including Biophilic Cities, Integrating Nature into Urban Design and Planning, Blue Urbanism, Exploring Connections Between Cities and Oceans, and the focus of tonight's program, The Bird-Friendly City, Creating Safe Urban Habitats. Professor Beatley directs the Biophilic Cities Project at uh, UVA and co-founded UVA's Center for Design and Health within the School of Architecture. We are so excited to have you with us tonight, Tim, and especially knowing we probably would have had to cancel this event if we were having you in person. Um, so all the better that it's virtual and thank you for being here with us. Um, at ECOC and hopefully everybody can give you a warm virtual welcome. Well, thanks, thanks so much. It's great to be with you. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, thank you for all that. Um, go ahead and, and share my screen. Very good. So I'm, I'm gonna uh, shoot for about 45 minutes maybe and hopefully we'll have uh, some time to, to talk at the end um, as well. And so my, my goal is to sort of do a couple of things here. Uh, one is to introduce you to this bigger, kind of broader concept of biophilic cities and tell you a little bit about the work that we've been doing and the network, global network that we're um, managing and, and trying to expand. Uh, and then, but the, the bulk of it, probably two thirds of the slides, uh, really has to do with this idea of the bird friendly city. So, so to begin, um, as was said in that nice introduction, I am an urban planner by, by training, by background. That's what I, I teach in a, in a school of architecture and very much thinking about how we design and plan cities. And of course we are increasingly the urban planet. 
Um, many of us are arguing that uh, cities have to be, you know, much more sustainable. Uh, we, we, we hope that we can create denser, more compact, walkable cities, cities that, uh, um, you know, have very small carbon footprints that move us in the right direction. Um, and when I talk about sustainable cities and compactness and density, I usually get this question, well, uh, what about nature? Can, can we have, in fact, nature at the same time that we have those compact and dense cities? And so this is one of the big questions we have been uh, dealing with, grappling with, and the answer is definitely yes. Um, so we argue that that a dense, compact city has to also be a natureful and 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 biophilic. So about ten years ago, we started this thing called the Biophilic Cities Project at at UVA, and it was all, really all about trying to understand uh, what cities are were doing around the U.S. and around the world to incorporate nature into the very core of their their fabric, very core of their design and planning. It does build on this idea of biophilia. Here, here is uh, one quote from, from E.O. Wilson. Uh, E.O. Wilson wasn't the first person to use the word biophilia, but he's really the one who's kind of coined it in the way we think of it today, this innate affiliation with nature, this love of nature, this idea that we uh, are hardwired to need and want that, that connection with, with the natural world. And so we believe that nature is not something optional. It's not something that you can just get once or twice a year on a, on a vacation, on a holiday. It has to be around us all the time where we're spending most of our, our time. It has to be integrated into the places we're spending our lives, really living our lives, the neighborhoods where we live. So many of you know that uh, unfor unfortunately, sad, sadly, E.O. Wilson passed away uh, just the day after Christmas, in fact. And um, it, shocking to me because I think we had come to think of him as this sort of unstoppable force of nature. And I guess I never really thought he was going to die, <laughs> but uh, he's a hero for, for us. Here's another quote. This is from a, a wonderful documentary film called Biophilic Design. Human species has grown up in nature. And I think that's very, very true. So um, we know there's a, an increasing amount of evidence about the power of nature and the importance of nature in our lives. And for me and for a lot of us, and I think for, for you, for, for this group especially, uh, this is probably obvious, but the, thinking about the, the things in life that give us uh, joy and delight and pleasure, and they are things like the photographs here. They're living things. They're uh, trees and flowers and butterflies and and water and of course birds and we'll spend we'll spend a lot of time talking about that. So uh, the evidence is really compelling, I think, uh, and it's growing almost daily it seems, or, or at least weekly or monthly. Um, we could spend the whole hour talking about that that evidence. Just give you a, a little bit of a window into it. Here here is a, a bioscience. A study uh, uh, article reporting on a study that uh, explored the relationship between green neighborhoods, the qualities, biophilic qualities of a neighborhood, the more uh, shrubs and trees and greenery and birds, uh, the lower levels of, of reported depression, anxiety, uh, and stress. And we have a, a, a lot of evidence and a lot of uh, studies that sort of reconfirm that, that, that finding. We know walking through a forest um, at the end of that walk, all of the positive uh, benefits it, 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 it gives us. It, it improves our mood, it enhances our cognitive abilities, it, it uh, um, you know, that does all these things to calm us and to, to lower our stress levels. And many of you probably know about the, this body of work coming out of Japan around forest bathing that shows that at the end of a walk through a forest that uh, you, you have this reduction in stress hormone levels that that walk uh, delivers a, um, you know, enhanced immune systems. And the Japanese are so convinced about this that they've established a network of forest bathing stations uh, around the, the country. So um, for us, this concept of biophilia is quite, quite important. We, we still don't completely understand why it is that nature has this power. Um, a lot of it uh, has to do, we think, with the fractals, the sh shapes and forms of, of nature, self-repeating shapes that, that 
that that small branch or bow is a small version of the, the larger tree. We see these shapes and forms, and and we see them in birds, by the way, and things like bird song. Uh, the image on the left, a really interesting uh, program in the UK, where they're uh, recording bird song and then playing playing it back um, at particularly stressful times when particularly children are going into surgery or, or being inoculated. Um, so we know that nature has this remarkable power and it's hard to actually summarize it because there are so many uh, aspects to it and so many different sort of effects and impacts that nature has. I, I put together this slide in an effort to try to summarize the research. It's pretty hard to get it on the slide, but everything on the right, these are all uh, things that are associated with uh, an increase in nature or the presence of, of nature. So again, in the presence of nature, we see lower levels of stress and anxiety and depression, higher levels of happiness, physical activity. We know that in greener neighborhoods, we're more likely to be outside, more likely to be, to be walking, uh, which has, of course, health effects. Um, lower crime rates. We have studies that show when you green neighborhoods and you green vacant lots that gun violence goes, goes down. Um, even evidence coming out of psychology that we're uh, more likely to be generous in the presence of nature, more likely to be cooperative, that you could make a pretty strong case that, uh, that we are better human beings when we have uh, nature all around us uh, where we're living and working. So if, if you ha had to summarize this with one word in the biophilic cities movement, we're frequently talking about flourishing. The concept of flourishing to me is important. It's not just about the, the pleasure and the delight we get, the benefits we gain from nature, but it's even deeper than that. It's about uh, me meaning in life, meaningful lives, and about deeper connections uh, to environment and place and deeper human connections. So flourishing captures for me a lot of these benefits. So uh, we have been arguing for a different uh, kind of model advocating a different vision of urbanism in cities. Uh, one where we don't see that city as disconnected from nature and we don't see humans as separate from nature, but rather intimately embedded uh, in nature. So um, we, biophilic cities are cities that work hard to connect us to that, to that nature. Obviously cities that uh, have lots of nature invest in that nature. Um, but it, it happens in a, in a more holistic way. It's not just a park. It's not just a few places of nature that you visit, but rather we begin to see the city itself as a, as a natural system, which it is, as an ecosystem. So Biophilic Cities for us, uh, certainly about uh, connections to nature and connections to humans through nature. It's also about beginning to see, see cities as places where we make space for many other forms of life, including birds. Uh, and of course, this word uh, coexistence that we're using in lots of cities today, that we, we have an ethical duty, an ethical obligation to, to make room and to share the spaces of a city in the midst of this uh, um, terrible global uh, moment of biodiversity loss, we begin to see cities at least a, as, as, a, as at least a partial response and antidote. And, and we begin to see again, cities as habitats for, for multiple species and not just human species. And of course, we benefit as well uh, as those other species. So in our cities, we, we have a global network of 20, 25 cities that are, have joined the network as, as partner cities. Um, here is an image from one, Singapore. Um, I, by the way, if I forget to say this, please do take a look at our web page, biophiliccities.org, a lot more information about the network and about the things, specific things our, our member cities are doing. But our network actually is larger than cities. We have, I think, 3,000 or more individual members and several hundred organizations that are part of this and part of really part of a larger global movement uh, to bring nature into cities, really. So this is an image from Singapore. Um, what we are seeing in our network is this, the emergence of this, really this new way of thinking about cities more holistically. Uh, Singapore, as some of you know, for many years called itself a garden city. More recently, it's referred to itself as a city and a garden. 
That seems like a, a small change, but really quite profound. We don't want to just uh, visit the garden or visit the forest or visit the park. We, we want to live in the park, in the forest, in the garden. And more recently, the city has uh, shifted and is now now described itself as a city in nature, um, and sometimes a biophilic city in nature, which might seem a little redundant, but we we like that redundancy. So, so Singapore is doing many things uh, to grow more nature, restore nature, celebrate that nature. This is an image of a green building uh, that actually is described a little bit on this bird friendly city book. But it's meant to illustrate uh, uh, one of the things the city does is require that when new buildings are constructed, uh, there, there's something called the landscape replacement policy. So you have to at least replace the nature lost um, at ground level from the footprint of the building one for one um, with nature in the vertical realm, with replacement nature, some of the nature you see here, sky parks and green rooftops and, and, and even trees planted on, on uh, on various terraces and levels of buildings. And there's now a, a kind of friendly competition in Singapore to see what, which building can sort of maximize the, the vertical nature uh, uh, incorporated into those designs. So if I uh, had to summarize the qualities, the, the elements of this vision, it's immersive nature, it's integrated continuous and seamless nature in the cities we live, it's integrating built and natural systems, it's a whole of city vision, meaning it's room or rooftop to region or bioregion and all of the, the scales in between. Um, it is a whole of life vision. So we want to, we want to have cities where uh, kids are exposed to nature at a very early age and they have that contact with nature through their entire life into adulthood uh, and into elderhood, if you will. And it's a culture of nature and a culture of biophilia. It isn't just uh, a city that ha has more nature. It's a, it's a city where we care about that nature, where we, we learn common species of, of flora and fauna, where we're engaged, actively engaged in, uh, in that nature and helping to restore that nature. It's about parks, but it's beyond parks. It's biodiversity and wildness. And increasingly, we understand it to be uh, a, a, an agenda of equity and social justice. So we believe nature is a birthright. Uh, everybody is entitled to it. And we know, particularly with American cities, we have longstanding systemic racism that's baked into the distribution of trees and nature. And that's a big uh, um, point of, of, of work for a lot of our, our cities to address the, those so, that historic social injustice. So um, lots of things our cities are doing. There is no one formula or, or one template of, of what a a biophilic city looks like in practice. Uh, what will work in Phoenix is different than what will work in New York or, or Singapore. Uh, so we have a, a, a just a wonderful variety of different things that our cities are doing to, to push this vision forward and incorporate nature. This is just a, a slide of some sampling of, of some of our cities and what they're, what they're up to. So um, a bit of background on the this larger vision of biophilic cities and, and this global network of cities. And then I want to transition and, and, and talk more specifically about uh, this new Island Press book, The Bird Friendly City, um, which came out last year. We, we've gotten some good press and I think some good conversations about uh, what it means to design a city that loves birds and thinks about birds. This image on the left is from a, a Fast Company a story. Um, and, uh, and so the, the subject of the book is, is, is perhaps obvious, but um, it is a, an effort to try to understand how we can shift our planning and design, our philosophy, our, our planning systems to better take into account uh, birds and, and many other forms of life. So um, I, I mentioned the saving grace is uh, during the pandemic, this has been a tough time, right, for, for all of us. And we're coming up now on two years. It's kind of hard to believe this. And uh, one of the things we've been trying to do in our, in our network is to capture what cities have been doing in real time to make nature more accessible and available to, to residents. And we have wonderful stories of our cities, Portland, Oregon, 
uh, changing, making you know movement through parks one directional, trying to maximize the numbers of people that can visit parks, for example. I think birds have been a big part of the story. They certainly have been for me. Um, and I have heard from so many people who are not necessarily birders, uh, but uh, they've discovered birds during the pandemic and that birds, birds, they're uh, watching birds and listening to birds. And I think birds have become this um, uh, source of constancy or normalcy or reassurance, right? In this, in these topsy-turvy times, they're, they're still migrating. They're still, you know, things, things aren't uh, so terrible. Um, and so I think if there's any saving grace, we've literally hatched a new generation of bird lovers. Um, about a year ago, we did a, a really big webinar and uh, we actually asked attendees to indicate in real time, you know, to tell us how important birds were. Actually, this is a this is an image from or a study showing mental stresses of COVID, but uh, here we are. Um, and so the image on the left actually is from this online poll, how important, how important has bird, bird watching been to you during the pandemic? And, and very few people saying it's not very important, many saying it's been extremely important to them. And of course we have all this evidence of that increasing traffic to bird, bird conservation sites and, and numbers of, of bird feeder sales on of bird feeders of bird feed and, and, and a, lot of, a lot of evidence, I think, that, we, that birds really have uh, caught on for a lot of, a lot of folks. So uh, for me, I, it's always a little intimidating talking to a bird club because I don't know that uh, I can call myself a birder but I have been a lifelong bird lover. And uh, I hear that wood thrush song and it immediately takes me back to my childhood in, in Virginia. And it makes me think of my parents and it makes me think about place and embeds me in place. And I look forward to I've been recording for a number of years when I hear the first uh, wood thrush sounds in April uh, here in Virginia. So. I think uh, birds for many of us are a very special part of our lives and, uh, and they, they do all these wondrous things uh, for us. Um, many of you know that we just lost, um, I think a day after you know, Wilson died, Tom Lovejoy, uh, who has been another leading light and a major force in the global conservation world. And so we've lost two very important advocates for biodiversity. And uh, in an interview uh, two years ago, he uh, told me how important birds were. And this quote that he's, he's said this in other places as well, but when you uh, take care of birds, or you think about birds, you take care of most of our big environmental problems. And uh, so what is good for birds uh, will generally be good for human beings. And I think that applies at the urban scale um, as, as well. But you all know better than I the challenges, right? The, the stresses, the, the, um, the threats that birds are facing today and, and the uh, Cornell uh, Ornithology Lab study from two, two years ago, or three years ago at this point, that was shocking, right, that we'd lost nearly a third of our abundance of birds in, in, in a short period of time, since only 1970. And of course, the, the threats being that we face or they face, birds face, seem daunting. They are daunting. It's climate change and it's uh, habitat loss and it's uh, increased use of uh, increased toxicity of pesticides. It's urban light, it's um, light pollution. It's all kinds of things. And I think for, a lot of us that is um, paralyzing in some ways. It's a, hard to know what you can do that would make a difference. And so uh, when it comes to thinking about design and planning of, of cities, there are in fact many things we can do and many things we can do individually as residents, as citizens of cities, but also many things that we can do at a, at a policy level. Um, and and we may not be able to uh, interact, we may not be able to reach a distant national government or have some imp 
back globally, but we can certainly lobby our city council um, to, to do things. And so what can we do? And this book was essentially a, a lot of interviews, a lot of uh, an effort to try to take stock of what's going on around the country and around the world. What are the things, the, the promising, optimistic things that cities are already doing? What must we do uh, moving forward? And of course, uh, a lot of the things we can do have, have to do with things like bird-friendly glass. We, again, I don't need to um, lecture this group about it. We know that birds don't see glass as a barrier. We know that they see what they often see as a reflected a cloud or, or a reflected vegetation or tree. Um, and, and we know what we can and must do. And, uh, and so uh, examples like the Jacob Davitt Center in New York, a complete retrofit of, of glass uh, installation of fritted, fritted glass, bird, bird safe glass, and a, and a more than 90% reduction in bird mortality as a result. And by the way, a reduction in, in the energy consumption of, of the building and the carbon emissions of the building, things that we also need and, and want to do, and the installation of a green roof um, that's actually been a nesting site for, uh, for some birds. So this is something we can, can get a handle on. This is something that we can influence. And it is about urban design and urban planning, and it's about architecture. And um, Michael Mazur, some of you know the work of FLAP uh, in Toronto, is a um, chapter in the book about that organization and, and the Toronto story. And he's frequently making the case or, or arguing that we should be uh, we should look, be looking for more interesting buildings um, that bird making architecture and, and buildings bird safe and bird friendly uh, doesn't come at the cost of architecture. It actually serves to enhance it, improve it, make our buildings more interesting, like this example of the Ryerson Student Center uh, in, in Toronto. Um, and we are, have begun to see a number of cities mandate bird safe design standards and bird safe glass. Um, and the book talks about uh, San Francisco, first American city, first US city to adopt mandatory bird safe design standards. New York, as many of you know, um, has the largest city to now mandate bird safe uh, glass um, and up to the first 75 feet and then 12 feet around green roofs. Uh, that will make a huge impact. As we know, um, you know so, so many birds that are moving, migrating, moving through uh, a city like, uh, like New York. And already we're beginning to see projects like the building on the left, a Kieran, Kieran Timberlake design uh, building at, at NYU. It's under construction now, entirely uh, fitted with, uh, with bird safe uh, glass. So we're going to see more of that. And uh, it remains a challenge, of course, to retrofit the existing building stock that we have, but uh, I think another point of optimism is the wonderful work a num we've seen in a number of cities to retrofit to existing buildings. And this is one story from the book, the Frick Environmental Center in Pittsburgh. Uh, by the way, on the web, on our Biophilic Cities webpage, one of the things we do is make films, uh, short films, five, seven, eight minute films about really uh, interesting exemplary uh, projects, stories, uh, examples. And so there is a six or seven minute film about the Frick Center. Um, love for everyone to go and watch, uh, watch some of the films. A number of the films have, 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 have a focus on birds. But here's an example of the Frick Center working with uh, high school students to design and install a paracord uh, system, a retrofit of this one side of the building, uh, making it bird friendly, um, relatively low cost a sort of approach. So I do think that we should be looking at uh, conducting a, some firm form of bird safe, uh, safe safety audit, you can call it that, of the existing building stock that we have around us. These are examples from my building where I'm sitting right now, uh, the School of Architecture at the University of Virginia. And uh, architects have been too slow I think to come to this to the importance to understand the importance of birds, they're catching up. Uh, but we have a lot of buildings like this one that, that are sort of 1970s era glass boxes. And so 
really interesting thing happened in the fall. We invited an ornithologist who teaches at uh, William and Mary, John, John Swaddle, some of you may know his, his wonderful work. And uh, he walked around with us, a group of uh, folks here, including representatives from the university architect's office. And, and we engaged in sort of a conversation about where, where are the, the especially dangerous parts of this building? Where uh, would retrofits have the most effect, the most impact by the way that the, this is my, me holding several of the birds that have um, you know, been killed from striking the building um, over the years. As I've thought here multiple decades, it's, you know, we've tried to do things, but we, we finally have some, I think, a, a, some momentum to do something. So, so anyway, John uh, walked with us around the building and, and there were some obvious places where we had, we've been, we've been finding birds over the years um, and, and like, for example, this, this uh, connection between the library and the main building you see on the top middle image where you, where you literally can see the white oak trees on the other side. Um, and there are blinds, but it would be quite a danger for, for birds. But then some places where the lower image where we hadn't quite um, realized that because of the uh, painting, the, the paint scheme on the inside, um, there's a sort of backlit effect, which means that the, re the, the, re the reflection of the, of the window is less. Uh, the reflection from, from, from that re the reflection of, of the tree, trees and greenery from the outside. So less of a danger, uh, a bird strike there, John, John believes. So I, I think that every uh, building and every campus and every city will have opportunities uh, for retrofitting. But many other things, of course, that cities can do and are doing, um, lights out programs pioneered in cities like Chicago, but also Toronto. Um, this is a newspaper story from Philadelphia. They started this last uh, migration um, with, the, with a voluntary lights out program. This is, I guess, the most recent city um, starting such a program. It's still relatively new. Uh, but we know we have the evidence that this uh, ha has a, a huge positive effect when you can get uh, building owners to turn turn off those lights from midnight to to six or seven in the morning, um, and it has a huge positive uh, benefit. And and lighting is a, a major thing that cities can do. Right, change their lighting and change their lighting codes, their lighting standards. And Pittsburgh um, is one of our twenty-five partner cities and the Bioflex Cities Network, really interesting work that they've been doing. They just adopted a mandatory dark sky ordinance, one of the largest cities to now uh, to have done that. And what that means is that they will be um, requiring uh, dark sky compliant lighting. This is lighting full cutoff lighting uh, in, in parks and along streets. And this will be good for connecting to the night sky. It'll be good for um, reducing energy consumption and carbon emissions, but it will also be good for, for birds and, uh, and bats uh, as well. So what else um, can we do at the urban level, the urban scale? And so one of the points I make in the book is that we, uh, birds are largely invisible in the urban planning frameworks that we see in cities. It's just a sampling of comprehensive plan covers from couple of California uh, cities and Denver. So you could pick almost any general plan or comprehensive plan or local master plan, different, different words that we use to describe uh, the, the, the main plan that a city uses to guide its development and growth. Um, you will see almost no reference to, to birds, um, very, very little reference to any other form, any, to any kind of wildlife or urban biodiversity, it's, it's getting better, um, but not much uh, when it comes to birds, especially. But there are some examples of places where, where uh, birds are a focus of planning uh, action and plan, planning um, activity. Vancouver is uh, an example that I talk a lot about in the book. Uh, they have even their uh, a city bird strategy they have a standing uh, bird committee 
that has developed a very detailed uh, recommendations for things the city uh, should do, a kind of action uh, plan. Um, this is a city that's gone through several iterations of selecting a, a city bird, 25,000 residents that participated in, in uh, selecting the permanent city bird uh, for Vancouver. So it's a city that really has put birds at the center of its design uh, and planning and, 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 and management, if you will. We could be doing more. Um, these are images from our partner city, Edmonton, Canada, and Edmonton is really an interesting example because of its focus on ecological connectivity and its planning system organized around that I idea. And, um, and so one of the steps, one of the things they've done is to do what's known as circuit, uh, applying circuit theory and understanding land use patterns there. And there's a software circuit, uh, circuit scaping. Essentially it's taking the concepts of an electrical circuit and sort of applying it to a city and trying to kind of understand where where are there points of blockage or where are there uh, places in the city for example if you were looking at the city as they have through the the eyes of a chickadee where you know are there places where the canopy stops or places where um, you have discontinuity where a bird can't move through that city really interesting work and for Edmonton it has meant uh, that they have invested a lot um, in these in uh, wildlife passages and in, and in doing things that design the city so that all kinds of, of life can live and move through that that city uh, safely um, and it goes back to this idea of, of coexistence and and, and co occupying the spaces of, of, a, of a city. So uh, pr probably more than any other city that we are aware of, they, they have again built built uh, many wildlife passages for many different kinds of animals, different sizes of animals. More than 35 at this point. You see some images here on the left of uh, one of the newer structures that they built in in 2019. What's really interesting uh, is that they have they. Uh, they're finding that they're seeing a, a marked reduction in car wildlife collisions because of these wildlife passages. So there are economic benefits um, that come in insurance, you know, rates, reductions in insurance cost, and all, all these sort of positive economic benefits connected to, to doing these things. But in, in addition to just the wonderful kind of outcome of living in a city where you have lots of nature and lots of wildlife around you. So um, one of the things we uh, talk a lot about in the Biophilic Cities Network is trees, tree conservation, tree protection. Um, and we uh, believe that we need to protect um, the nature that exists in, in cities and in particular the older trees that exist. We have a, a, a newfound understanding of of how important those older trees are. We can't just be, be um, planting saplings or, or young trees. That's not going to be the answer. Uh, we need to do that as well, but we need to protect those older trees. They sequester so much carbon. They um, you know, retain stormwater. They do so much for us, and they do so much for birds. And they help to connect us, right? Well, this wonderful quote here on the right, James Canton, his book, The Oak Papers, talking about how touching the skin of an oak um, will help us to feel a little bit of the trace of, of those who've gone before us. And that, the, that these older trees, this by the way is me standing uh, next to a tree in the Netherlands from a, a few months ago, but um, they are the, the connections between past, present, and future, right? They, they are the connective tissue. And they are of course very important for birds. And uh, so we've been very interested in trying to understand what cities are doing, what their codes are like, how stringent they are, uh, trying to understand sort of best practice. This is Asheville, North, North Carolina, um, where there is a very active citizen group now trying to get the city to adopt bird safe design and also lights out. They have a, 
a, uh, a regulatory system that, that imposes a can minimum canopy standard for a new development in that city. Or cities like Palo Alto, California, that have a, a pretty strong permitting system based on protecting certain species, and in particular species like this, the coast live uh, oak, and allowing permits for cutting those trees down only under certain circumstances when protected trees are either dead or hazardous. Um, and, and so raises uh, some interesting ethical questions, right, about, about, the, about private property and about the ability of a, of a homeowner to, to cut down that tree. But uh, I know most of you know about Doug Tallamy's work. I'm a big fan of him, of his work, and we, I interviewed him actually for the book uh, so he makes an appearance in the Bird Friendly uh, City book. Um, I highly rec recommend his new newest book, The Nature of Oaks. And I had not fully appreciated the, the synergies and the mutualisms between oak trees and birds, and in particular species like blue jays. Um, and uh, the fact even that the blue jay bill is a, you know, has evolved to in a way that allows that species to, um, to open an acorn and access the meat of that acorn. And this really interesting mutualism that Talamy describes so eloquently that, um, that that single blue jay is going to, in, a, in, one, in one season, uh, perhaps bury as many as 4,000 or more uh, acorns. So there's a mutualism. The tree provides the food for the blue jay. The blue jay serves to distribute that uh, and expand that that tree, that species of tree. Re really interesting uh, ideas. So um, we've got to reimagine the landscaping around us in cities. There's a whole category of public policy here. And uh, wherever we can, moving away from uh, very sterile single species turf grass lawns is something that uh, is better for birds um, and, uh, and native species gardens. This, this is our colleague Nina Marie Lister from Toronto. Uh, that is her garden, her, her lawn on the left in her house in the background. And uh, a whole story, interesting story, troubling story about Toronto's um, tall grass and weeds ordinance. And she uh, actually confronted this firsthand. The inspector came and uh, told her she, she, her lawn was in violation of the tall grass and weeds code, or what they call a bylaw there. It's a longer story. Um, she uh, almost single-handedly got this, started conversations in the city about it very inconsistent with all the other wonderful things that the city of Toronto is, is doing, and including around bird, bird conservation, bird protection, um, and, and a, a biodiversity strategy and a ravine strategy, some wonderful things they've been doing. So the mayor came to her uh, yard to look. And, and anyway, they, she has managed with others to get the code, the bylaw changed. So it is now possible, it is, a, it is, you have the right, it's a, it's a, a by right use to install a native garden uh, in your lawn or your spa spaces around your home. We can be thinking about this at a city scale um, and, and we have some wonderful examples of this. Um, Cura de Bot is a, is a city in Costa Rica, one of our 25 partner cities and they've reimagined their entire city under this so-called sweet city um, vision, which is about the, um, planting pollinator gardens uh, in parks and, and along sidewalks and creating bio corridors through the city. Uh, and, and this really wonderful idea, as you see in the headline of this Guardian story on the left, of giving citizenship to bees and plants and trees and birds. What a, what a wonderful idea. It's about rewilding where we can, of course, right? Looking at all those hard surface spaces, sterile spaces in cities and making them more uh, bird friendly, especially incorporating water that birds need so badly. This is a, a wonderful story from Perth in Western Australia, also described in the book, uh, a conversion of a sterile, uh, energy intensive chlorinated water feature into what is now a native biodiverse wetland in the middle of the city. It's a wonderful story. We have a eight or nine minute film uh, about this on our webpage as well. I'd love for you to watch, uh, watch that. 
So I'm quickly running out of time. The book uh, talks about a lot of the other challenges that we're facing um, and uh, predation of by um, you know domestic and feral cats, a big issue, what to do about that. We can have a discussion about it. Um, you know, programs to advocate for people bringing, keeping their cats inside uh, works to some degree, right? Uh, products like uh, the rainbow collar, this is actually my cat <laughs> with a rainbow collar. A lot of evidence that those collars do work um, and uh, it's one part of the answer or the products like the cat bib that that uh, makes it hard for, for cats to launch themselves to catch a bird or capture a bird. Um, we, in the spirit of coexistence, one of the interesting bits of research now is that where we coexist with coyotes, we've got coyotes everywhere, right? In every American city. Um, making room for coyotes may, it actually shows, the evidence shows that the, uh, the movement patterns of domestic cats is reduced and constrained because of the presence of coyotes. And so, Having coyotes around actually may be pretty good for birds in that in that way. Uh, we've made a, a an interesting film about uh, this innovation coming out of Portland, and it's there's a chapter in the book about it uh, called the Catio, uh, or the Cat Patio. And uh, these are images actually from a of an annual event in Portland. Uh, wonderful collaboration between the Portland Audubon and the Feral Cats Coalition of Oregon. So cat lovers and bird lovers getting together to try to solve this problem. And so Catio um, can be, I guess it's only one picture that I have, but there do take a look at the film online. Uh, but the idea of having this space, outdoor space, often literally connected to a house where a cat can be outside, but yet uh, birds are protected from that, from that cat. So this is um, a yearly event where they, it's kind of like a garden tour where they have 10 uh, catios on display. You you buy a ticket um, and you you move around and visit the different catios and get lots of ideas for what your catio could be. And some of them are really low cost, not very sophisticated. Others are are really kind of you know wonderful architectural design structures. So coming to the end, um, a, a lot of emphasis in the book and in our network around this idea of awe. And we want a biophilic city to be a city where you have opportunities for awe, a city that maximizes moments uh, of awe. And uh, awe is one of those things. Um, it is a sense of vastness, a sense of seeing something unexpected, something that, that doesn't even seem possible, uh, that nut hatch going, you know, defying gravity, uh, moving up and down that tree. Uh, I think birds deliver a, a sense of the awe um, in really important ways for a lot of us. Anyway, evidence that uh, in the presence of awe, experiencing awe, uh, we, we, we benefit from, from this, there is this increase in well-being, but also uh, associated with pro-social behavior. Uh, here is uh, Rich Liu's definition of awe, something unexpected that stimulates a sense of vastness and possibility. And this is a group of my students actually going on one of our bird, bird watching uh, walks. But a lot of other uh, connected ideas, curiosity, discovery, wildness, magic, um, and, and the spectacle uh, of, of nature in, in a city and coming together to uh, celebrate and appreciate the, the nature, um, especially birds. So you, most of you probably know about the Vox's Swifts and the, um, the story of the Chapman Elementary School in Portland. It's another story in the book. Uh, thousands of, of, of these swifts that come through the city um, during September and they, uh, they move through and they uh, historically have, have roosted very dramatically as the sun goes down, they sort of drop in mass into this chimney. And um, these are images from one evening in September where we filmed there. Another film that you could watch on our, on our webpage and it was quite, quite remarkable. Uh, to see. I think on, the, on this evening, the estimate was that there were perhaps 6,000, 6 or 7,000 Swiss that, that, um, that were roosting in this, in this chimney that, that evening. Um, and somebody mentioned a Cooper's Hawk earlier, and we caught on film. It. Cooper's Hawk at a certain point came and, and sat on the top of the chimney, and the crowd was sort of 
booing the Cooper Sock. We, we love the Cooper Sock as well, of course, but it, would, it, uh, it was this, this point of drama. And then at a certain point, the Cooper Sock flew away and the crowd started applauding. And it, anyway, um, I think we have some of that on, on, on the film. So um, a, a, a lot of the book has to do with how we can rethink buildings and rethink architecture. And, and so as I come to the end of this, uh, there are so many ways we could do that. Um, this is a story from London of a, of a chimney, reconstructed chimney that actually, actually incorporates 15 nesting boxes for common swifts and uh, we're, we're not a species not doing very well. And, and also um, space for, for bats in the center. And this is a trend that we're seeing. And uh, so this is a wildlife friendly development in the UK also described in the book. And it's um, one uh, being built by the UK's largest developer who is, who's committed to making every development uh, wildlife friendly and bird friendly. And so these are, um, this is a situation actually where, where you might be asked if you want swifts um, in the facade of your home that you're about to buy. And so I, I love this idea. I think that's where we're going. Uh, here is some work um, of Joyce Wong. This is a, an architecture professor at the University of Buffalo, this idea of habitecture and facade walls. So designing the, all the spaces, all those facades, um, all those envelopes of a building as opportunities for, uh, for habitat and activating neighborhoods to begin to think about birds and to come together around birds. And this is a story from the book, uh, a neighborhood that I spent some time at in New Mexico, just outside um, Santa Fe um, and their work to, to do things on behalf of this juniper titmouse, it's not doing well. So I'm getting to the end, uh, lots more we could talk about. Um, I think we need to incorporate birds uh, more squarely into the things we're teaching kids and to STEM uh, curricula into school curricula more generally. We ought to kind of reimagine every school as a bird immersive uh, 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 habitat. And we can do that. Um, and so the book is a little more comprehensive and, and a number of things that we need to be thinking about um, finding ways to do without you know, pesticides in cities. We have lots of examples of that, park systems that have moved away from pesticides, pesticide use. Again, rethinking lighting, um, addressing the cat predation uh, problem. Uh, so hopefully you will get a chance to see the book and I'm kind of coming up on the last slide. So last thing I wanted to just um, throw out as a, as a possible idea is beginning to judge the progress uh, or the goodness of a city in, in different ways and, and through different kinds of metrics. And that's one thing that we're doing in this Biofluid Cities Network. So uh, these are, this is an image from, or images from Zealandia in Wellington, New Zealand. Wellington is one of our partner cities and they have this wonderful wild area in the middle of the city where they have erected predator-proof fences as a way of allowing the, the native birds to rebound. And it has been very successful, uh, actually. And their tagline is bringing birdsong back to Wellington. So this idea maybe that instead of the usual metrics that we use, um, we're usually judging a city by gross domestic product or economic metrics of some kind, or regional domestic product, or um, that we, that we Come up with some different metrics, and so one of them is bird song. I, I find that compelling that we that every resident of a city in every neighborhood ought to be able to hear native bird song, and that we judge the goodness um, or the quality of a city in that in that way. So there are a lot of um, new things on the horizon, and I think I'll just flip through. If anything looks interesting, we can circle back. Um, John Swaddle has done all this work around the idea of acoustic lighthouses that might be another uh, strategy for, uh, for um, steering birds away from, from uh, dangers like cell towers and, and, uh, and wind turbines and so on. And the idea of uh, uh, window collision sensors uh, so that every building we, we monitor um, more comprehensively bird strikes and so on. 
So actually, this is the last slide. I wanted to just make a, a pitch, as I do a bit in the book, that we, we need to choose to love nature. Um, and there is so much inspiration and so, so much to be learned from indigenous cultures. And, uh, and so uh, Noel Nanup, who you see here, is a, a member of the Noongar um, Aboriginal uh, community in Western Australia. And we interviewed him uh, for the book and actually a, a film as well. And in their culture, it's a, it's a totemic culture. So at an early age, uh, he um, was given a, a, a species to, that became his totem. And in, in this case, it was the bronze winged pigeon. And the idea is that you embrace that, that species, that, that form of life. You learn everything you can about it. You become its champion, its protector. Um, and I, I think that's an interesting tradition that maybe all of us should embrace. And it may be not one bird, but multiple birds or, or multiple uh, animals that co-occupy spaces of cities. So that's, um, that's it in a, in a nutshell. Um, and there, here is the book. And I think this uh, still, this code, discount code still works. Uh, if you were to buy this book from, from um, Island Press, it would give you 30% discount. So I'm often showing that. So this is my very last slide, which is again to, to remind you about our, our uh, Biofolk Cities um, webpage. And there is a Bird Friendly City page within this larger uh, website. So we've been trying to uh, upload onto that page uh, news stories and, and a lot of, a lot of uh, material that might be, might be helpful. OK, I'm going to stop there and stop sharing. And uh, hopefully, we, can have, we have some time for some um, comments and discussion and so on. I think maybe I have stopped sharing. Have I stopped sharing? Yes, you stopped sure. sharing. How that happened. I didn't really <laughs> press anything. It just sort of happened. Um, um your okay. the the um URL for the the discount for the book went by awfully quickly. Is it yeah. Um, Do you want me to put it back up? Would that if be if you could put that up for just a minute in case there are people that might sure. um, I think if that's just... a that's a good size discount. And it's a good way to support yes. Island Press at the same yeah, time. Or, or even better, uh, paste it into the chat uh, where people okay. can click on it. Let's That's a great idea. That. Thank you, John. Uh, Thank you, John. <clears throat> go back to that and, and uh, give me a second. And um, um, if, if for some reason, so the discount is, the code is webinar. I'm just going to copy and paste all of that into the chat box, but um, let's see, uh, get back to the, see if that works. How about that? There you yeah. go, yeah. yeah. And if, yeah. Okay, do we have time for questions? It's, oh, it's yes. getting close to nine, yeah. isn't it? No, we do. Thank you so much, Tim. That was, you covered so much territory and, uh, I think it, it gives a, a little window into this incredible world that you, that you live in of looking at cities as possibilities for um, coexistence among all species. Mm -hmm. And it's just a very refreshing um, look at uh, these environments, not as, as barren places, but as places of real potential and possibility. So thank you for bringing that perspective and giving us a little window into uh, the remarkable work you've been doing all throughout um, that is manifesting obviously in the work, the most recent work that, that you were talking about today with the, with the birds. Um, so Thanks. first and foremost, thank you. Just fabulous uh, content and, um, and your enthusiasm is, Greatly appreciated all of this too. Well, thanks. I'm I'm just seeing some some comments on the on the chat. Box. Yes, and yeah. there are um, there were some questions earlier on too, and I, there was one I felt like had um, uh, would have some resonance for a number of us about. Um, would love to know how the Boston metro area is on, uh, on biophilia and, and bird friendliness. Um, uh, Carol yeah. was asking about that and how one gets a feeling, how you get that information. 
Yeah, um, that's a great question. We were talking earlier about uh, cl city, the closest biophilic cities in our network, and there aren't very many. And I uh, um, and I, I don't know uh, much about Boston from the perspective of birds. Um, and I, you, you all will know better than I. I mean, is there an effort to do things like lights out programs in Boston, or to are there any kind of bird safe design standards like the kinds of that um, that New York and in San Francisco and Toronto uh, have adopted and I, I don't really know I'm trying to think of whether um, terrible to say but I, I don't know that there is e even any mention of, of Boston and in, in, in the in the book um, so I mean there are a lot of things that Boston is is doing if, um, that that do will connect to birds will have a, a meaningful uh, impact. So I, I, I said a lot about trees and I know the city has just started uh, a new tree uh, plan. Um, a, a lot of cities are you know setting higher um, canopy targets um, and that's really and that's good. And so I think that's just beginning though and, and they I, they are they are focused a lot on on social equity and trying to kind of understand where underserved neighborhoods or neighborhoods of color that have historically had lower levels of tree canopy uh, ha, are and 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 to focus on those uh, neighborhoods. Um, I mean, there's a obviously you know a very a very impressive park system going back to Olmstead and and you know lot, lots of um, wonderful green elements to to Boston and greater Boston area. Um, and, and those things are all, I've got to be positive from a bird, you know, bird conservation point of point of view or Boston, you know, Harbor Islands and lots, you know, lots of ways of answering it. But I, I don't know, is there, there must be an Audubon group, I expect. There, there, there is, of course, Mass Audubon is a prominent organization, but okay. um, uh, th there are, you know, there's lots of green space around Boston and lots of bird friendly things, but unfortunately a lights out program is not one of them. It's not, not one. Okay. Um, and, and how about right where you are locally? Is that, is that something that, are, are these things you could do? We have, we have this. I just this chime thing. in here. We, Mass yeah. Lake did promote a lights out program a, a number of years ago, which was quite successful. I just don't know what his current at statuses but yeah. it, it does there was a lot of buy and that was probably about 10 years ago so it's it's incorrect to say that there was nothing i just don't know what's going on right now okay great in fact they even, they even had yeah. some people studying bird collisions uh, mass audubon and, and okay. some of the buildings would that was a project of one person in particular who would go around censusing what was being what was falling out of the sky in some of the large buildings there. So yeah. there's something that were that was yeah. Yeah. an active thing. So yeah. It, it's incorrect to say that nothing was going on. Nothing's there. done. Okay. That's yeah. that's that's good. I'm not sure how it's, what's going on right now. Okay. Well, what, what have what have I missed or what are you um are, are you thinking about in terms of uh, uh, your city or any city? I mean are there things that you think we should be doing and things that urban planners should be thinking more about or yeah uh, i you know wrote this book in part because i again i think that there's power that again we don't feel like we have that much control over things that are happening far away but we we do have a lot of control right and uh locally or, or we potentially do still you still have to access that political system, and there's still, you know, lots of ways in which. Well, one, of, one, one of the things I think about is is not just uh, the, the 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 greenery and the canopy and that kind of thing, but also water yeah. quality. Yeah. Uh, well, your 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 book has a, a picture of a great blue heron. What's the quality of the water that he's fishing in? How many heavy metals are in those uh, uh, yeah. those uh, fish that he's eating? I I, I see this. Around uh, Rio de Janeiro, where I spent some time, which uh, has uh, tons of greenery and you know yeah. bits of rainforest in it, and uh, magnificent frigate birds flying all around the shore, 
and you see them way up in the upper reaches of the canals that feed into Guanabara Bay, all of which are fetid cesspools of horribly polluted water. And they're they're eating there. Uh, and, you know, so I, I, I think we need to think beyond uh, the uh, terrestrial landscape to the yeah. rest of the habitat. Yeah, that's a really good, really good point. Um, and, and in fact, I didn't talk about this at all tonight, but there there is a, a, um, a, a major focus for a number, a number of the cities in our in our network are coastal cities. And uh, so there is this sort of emerging vision, uh, sometimes called referred to as blue urbanism or this notion of an ocean city connecting the terrestrial and the marine habitats. Um, and so we're beginning to see a lot more work in that area. Ply Plymouth in the UK, for example, has just, um, along with the national gov government, created a, its entire sound now. It's, it's the first um, national marine park, actually. And, and we're seeing a lot of our cities do that kind of fo focus a lot more on the marine and on the water quality. And, and as uh, cities like New York, you know, New York has gotten a lot of attention lately because of the return of, of whales um, to the waters of New York. And people now, you know, they're whale watching uh, cruises. And I mean, it's a really interesting story. We have a film about that also on our webpage. Well, one of the reasons, one of the key reasons is that is that because the water quality is, has improved uh, over, over time. I mean, compared to sort of the, the gritty industrial port, you know, kind of um, environment that it, it used to be, P plenty of pollution still, but, but water quality has improved enough that you see Menhaden, you know, the, the primary, one of the primary uh, food, food sources for humpback whales. So the humpback whales are coming in to, to feed on the Menhaden that, you know, they're there. A lot more, a lot more work to do, right? And we've got a billion oyster project and a lot of, a lot of wonderful ideas, living breakwaters and things that would continue to further and improve the, the water quality. So you're absolutely right. And the circles back to Tom Job Lovejoy's point, right? That we think about what's good for birds. Uh, we, it connects to everything and it'll connect to water quality. Um, so that's, it, you know, and, and years ago, I don't, I, I don't know what's happened with Boston Harbor. I, I, I think back to, uh, I'm old enough that I remember Michael Dukakis and, you know, I remember the, the big debate about about Boston Harbor and and um, what what needed to, to happen to, to, to clean it up and I don't you know don't know what's where, where things stand and whether whether things are moving in the right direction or moving at all I don't know it it's happened in, yeah it's in much much greater shape than it was, was 20 30 years ago it's, okay. it's uh, uh, r remarkable yeah. recovery so it's still still work to do but it's yeah yeah, state-of-the-art uh, state-of-the-art wastewater treatment facility. Yeah, that helps. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm in. Uh, this is Doug Foy. Uh, I'm interested in the connection between all that you're doing, talking about in cities and birds, uh, with the whole movement now on trying to make cities more climate resilient and climate friendly. And virtually yeah. everything you're talking about: uh, windows, light, um, right. water quality tree canopy um, yeah. are all fundamental elements of a climate strategy. All these cities, Boston certainly, um, have climate agendas now, very aggressive ones. And by the way, the harbor is one of the cleanest harbors in the world now because of the treatment plant built at great expense, but has an enormous success. We have Menhaden in the city with oh, strike bass chasing them around all the time. So it's- okay. uh, fantastic. Um, but the, uh, the, it seems to me one of the ways to, to up the ante on your, the, the nature of your arguments is to connect them much more directly to the climate change benefits that uh -huh. are accomplished because yeah. there's a powerful worldwide movement now and demand for climate right. agendas. Um, and that will, everything that you talked about in the cities have direct and immediate climate benefits, a tree canopy alone uh, that yeah. Uh, yeah. cuts down on heating, yeah. heat island effects, uh, lights, lights at night. I mean, it's yeah. one thing. I, are yeah. you seeing that that connection? Yeah, we, we definitely are, and we and we 
subsequently uh, focus a lot on that in our presentations. I didn't tonight because I sort of did a, a, a really, as you can tell, a really abbreviated version of, of the biophilic side of it. But uh, yes, we, we're, we're, we're frequently talking about biophilic cities uh, are, are resilient cities. I mean, that anything, almost anything you can do to make a city more natureful will make it more resilient uh, and help us adapt, right? There's the, the, the sort of adaptation side of it, um, but also the mitigation side, right? So uh, as you say, trees, wonderful example. We can, we, you know, it's, it's the best way we can address urban heat. Um, and it's also going to add habitat. Uh, but it's also going to that that evapotranspiration and 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 shading and cooling benefit also helps to reduce the energy consumption of buildings. So it 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 you know helps us on the mitigation side of climate as well. So in some cities that uh, we've we've been working with, and you know Dallas and places where they have the Texas Tree Foundation has done the analysis that shows that you know if you plant trees in certain places and certain numbers. Uh, you can you can literally change the climate. You can you can re reduce you know ambient temperatures by ten or twelve or fifteen degrees. I mean, it's really right. really remarkable. Right. Um, so so the power of trees. Uh, yeah. But everything else, green rooftops, and you know, think, think all the things that we're interested in doing, incorporation of water, a whole bunch of things. And this is something that obviously connects to Boston. But the, the how we adapt to sea level rise. Right. Uh, it is a huge part of the climate agenda, <clears throat> you know, right now, and, uh, and reimagining shorelines and and um, you know strategic retreats and all these all these things that might represent opportunities for birds and nature as well. Nature nature based solutions to coastal adaptation is a really big and growing and you know it's gain gaining and and traction. So you're right. so you're absolutely right. Um, and uh, and we, we often make that 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 point uh, as well. In, in Boston, we handle it by building more and more closer to the water's edge. That's what they seem <laughs> to be doing. Okay. Um, uh, Tim, Carol Gerard was wondering um, if you have any suggestions on how to work some of these ideas into the upcoming infrastructure funding efforts. Ooh. Yeah. Um, well, every state, well, uh, you know, the, the opportunities will be a little bit different, but I, I, I don't know. I, I did a, I did a session uh, on a panel last week um, with uh, the, the Waterfront Alliance in New York that runs this, this waters at Waterfront Edge design guidelines, voluntary guidelines. Um, and their the discussion was about what, what's it going to mean for coastal um, resilience and coastal mitigation, coastal projects, and and um, so much of that money, 1.2 trillion dollars. Th there is about 50 billion dollars coming to in the in um, uh, will be spent for be available for climate resilience, right? Um, directly tying to the last question, and so I could imagine a lot of those projects. Would in, could incorporate things that would be good for birds, um, but the the lion's share of the money that is going to go for a whole bunch of of fairly conventional infrastructure, I'm afraid, you know, it's roads and bridges and and airports and broadband and and all of you know all those things, and I don't know. Yes. Bridges are collapsing in Pittsburgh, and you know we obviously that's something we we need to to think about, worry about, invest in. But I'm I'm not sure at the end of that, you know, big expenditure, multiple multi-year expenditure into the future, whether um, environment is necessarily going to benefit a lot from that. I mean, I, you, we could electric charging stations, and you know there will be a lot of things that that are good. Um, and that and that will be positive, but I don't know how. Um, I, I could imagine if you're working at the state level and there's a, a coastal armoring project, or or there there will be lots of opportunities to try to guide things and shift them in, in the direction of things that would be more uh, nature nature based or bird bird friendly. But I don't have any specific examples 
at this point, but I, I think it's a, it's a really good thing to keep, keep front of mind, I believe. That's a good question. Yeah. Constance, uh, did you want to chime in here? Uh, yeah, I was just looking at a question from uh, Robert Booksbaum. He was wondering how much can you promote nesting by birds? Promote nesting? Yeah, specifically nesting, I think is what he's asking. Yeah, well, um, in the in the book, there's some, we, you know, interesting story of the horn, hornbills in in Singapore, where they um, it, it's a wonderful success story. This is a really highly urbanized, built up city state, um, and the hornbills, um, Oriental pied hornbills, several species of hornbills that were more were native at some point. Um, they devised these really high tech sort of smart nesting boxes and uh, they, um, you know, these boxes that will have built built in weights and, you know, digital weighting and you know, kind of all kinds of really, this, this impressed me anyway, it may not impress you all as much, you know more about this than, than I do, but those boxes in, in highly urbanized areas had a huge impact. And, and now uh, those hornbills are, are a um, common sight in this urbanized you know, place of Sing Singapore. So in the right locations, I think, yeah. Um, the, the nesting story from that Santa Fe neighborhood is, is, is sort of interesting, a much different kind of context, but... Um, that um, I think maybe one of the largest um, nest 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 watch. What's the what's the Cornell nest? Um, the nest cam. I yeah. I don't know. No, it's, it's, well, it's the uh, yeah. Um, the yeah, feeder watch. Basically, yeah. feeder feeder. Well, not it's not feeder watch, but it's the it's the ver version for nesting. What's, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the, on the it's nest watch. Is it nest watch? Okay. Nest watch. okay. It doesn't quite sound like the right words to me, but, um, and so they, they engaged essentially in this sort of neighborhood wide collective nest watch, you know, where, where they, I, I really love the idea of, of sort of building community around, um, around birds, you know, where you're doing, you're kind of doing things together uh, for a common goal. And, um, and, and yeah, so that, that's a quite, a, quite a positive story that um, a, a bit of a case study described or told in the, in the book. Very cool. Jim McCoy was wondering what, what did Vancouver pick for their city bird? I knew you were gonna ask me that. <laughs> uh, and I, I wanna say black, uh, black cap chickadee, but I, uh, I, have to find, I have to tell you, uh, hold, hold on one second. Well, that's Somebody not very has, original. No, but they they have a uh, some some particular historical connections to. Um, yeah, it's a black cap chickadee. Uh, that was the last bird, but they had. Um, um, well, anyway, I'm not prepared to tell you, but they they've got they went through a very interesting process where they they've I think they voted like three times on on three different occasions, so that so the first two selected birds end up sort of ended up sort of being classified as temporary city the temporary city bird on the way to this longer um but the chickadee was chosen and I, I don't know there were there were sort of um attributes associated with particular species and the chickadee was sort of characterized as this this little resilient bird you know that can uh i don't know there's something very appealing to to, to them about that and to those who voted on the bird. They never asked the birders about these things. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, but that uh, a lot of birders were very involved in the process, you know, of, of, and, and on the birding bird committee and all the other, but, but yeah, 70, what did I say, 75,000 votes? No, their website claims it's Anna's Hummingbird. Um, that, that was the, uh, I think that was the earlier one though. That, that's one of the one or two, um, are you on the, the bird city on the, um, yeah, I'm just looking at what Google claims is their official city uh, bird. Yeah, I think that's, um, at least my notes and it's, I, I have to refer to the book, uh, 
which I, I don't have in front of me, but I, I have 75,000 votes for the winner, black cap chickadee. But, but you know, maybe that was an earlier bird, but I don't think so. Yeah. Anyway, we, we'll figure it out. But um, <laughs> Um, Shall one more one more question, perhaps, uh, to wrap things up tonight, uh, so Tim can actually go home from work <laughs> at the university. Well, I'm um, happy to stay as long as there are questions or comments. But uh, by the way, I, I I may come back because uh, I'm very excited that you have Drew Lanham. Um, he is uh, he is a hero. I'll just put a plug in for your next speaker. Um, I don't know if you have heard, heard him before, but he's he's wonderful. Uh, he, he is a, a poet and a, I mean, it's just it's, it's a you, you will really enjoy enjoy him and and, and um, in the book. Uh, there's a little story about him. I went I traveled down to North Carolina to hear him speak at Warren, Warren, Warren Wilson College. And um, he was very moving and um, we, we've been trying to make a film about him. But we haven't quite been able to do it, but he, he's a big hero. Mm. So, and then the and the movement to make birding more more inclusive, he's he's really you know right there. So. Yes, and um, uh, you've been mentioning the films, Tim, and I just wanted to point out that on the Biophilic Cities website there is a there is a page that's devoted to uh, the bird friendly cities and on yeah. that there's a whole array of wonderful short films that you've you've put in there so that's a great resource for extended content uh, related to this work um, yeah so not a number of them are about birds and they can and they directly connect to stories in the in the book so there's a, a wonderful short film about burrowing owls in phoenix that we made um, the story from the book and then also the Vox of Swifts and the uh, Catio. And um, we have an Atlanta Audubon uh, film uh, filmed in, in Piedmont Park um, and uh, about thinking about Atlanta as a bird friendly city. But yeah, thanks for the plug. Um, well, Constance, anything else you wanted to pull from uh, things in the chat or should we wrap it up here? No, but I did want to say it's been a really lively chat. So even though there aren't any questions specifically to you, there is a lot of information. You've inspired a lot of people. Great. So I really want to thank you for that. Wonderful. Yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, conversation and and interest in how we can engage our political system in in uh, making different kinds of decisions going forward. And of course, that involves our engagement. So. Um, well, Tim, thank you so much. This has really been uh, a treat and educational and fun and uh, wide ranging. Um, and we'll look forward to uh, keeping up with the work that you're doing because that obviously yeah. connects to- That'd be great. And, and if you're in a city that you think would like to join the Biophilic Cities Network, let me know. We talked about this earlier, whether it's Salem or- or Boston or wherever, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, that's an exciting opportunity for sure. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for all you're doing. Really, really appreciate all, you, all, the, all your work and, and activism. Great. Come back again okay. soon. And, bye bye. Uh, uh, so everybody, uh, again, the next talk will be uh, March 4th. 7.45, Drew Lanham, right after a short ECLC meeting. We hope to see you again soon. Have a good evening. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a good night.